This audio book is entitled The Fort Knox Gold Scandal and What It Means to You. The author is Dr. Peter David Beter, the internationally respected political economist and financial consultant, now famous as the man who opened Fort Knox in 1974. The present message was recorded March 1, 1975. It is a sequel to Dr. Beter's earlier audio book, How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War, which was recorded October 11, 1974. Dr. Beter's credentials include 10 years as a practicing attorney in the nation's capital from 1951 to 61. Six years as counsel to the United States Export-Import Bank from 1961 to 67, to which he was appointed by President Kennedy, and five years as one of the chief developers of private international business in the Republic of Zaire in Africa from 1968 to 1973. Further details on his career are given in Who's Who in the East and in other biographical books, including the Blue Book of London, England. Dr. Beter is now involved in the work of the American Patriots Committee which he founded with other concerned citizens on August 20th, 1974. Dr. Beter welcomes inquiries and may be reached at the American Patriots Committee, 1629K, the letter K Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2006. Part 1. The Big Picture My friends, the overthrow of our great free republic our beloved United States of America is now far advanced and proceeding rapidly. The powerful family dynasty that now rules America behind the scenes is succeeding in its plan to bring upon us a horrendous new depression combined with runaway inflation and cruel shortages. By Election Day 1976, they plan to have Americans in a desperate situation, ready to grasp at any straw of hope, and while we are dazed and weakened, we will be invited to scrap our beloved Constitution, to accept their new one as the answer to all of our problems. If we fall into their scheming trap and accept their diabolical new Constitution, we will be forfeiting the freedoms we take for granted, consenting to our enslavement and that of our children. Oh no, you may say, we would never fall for such a thing. What a preposterous idea! It's too far out. Then I must warn you now that the dynasty has one great ally which is indispensable to their efforts to take over America completely. I refer to that cherished belief down deep within most Americans that it couldn't happen here. So long as we cling to this comforting but groundless thought, we are incapable of the vigilance which is the price of liberty. We rationalize the way strange and dangerous developments that take place before our very eyes. Instead of raising questions and demanding the truth from those who are supposed to be our public servants, we lull ourselves to sleep, telling ourselves, I guess what they're doing must be okay, even though I don't like it and I don't understand it. And so it is that our last elected President and Vice President have been forced to flee from their respective offices to be replaced by an appointed President and an appointed Vice President before our very own eyes. We have been deliberately robbed of our franchise, and dare we still say it couldn't happen here? My first audiobook recording, made in October 1974, alerts you to the existence of the powerful family dynasty in America and explains how they have connived for over a century to gradually seize control of America. That message also outlines their game plan for the next several years and offers concrete suggestions on how to protect yourself. 
The dynasty's plans are still as I described them in my message of October 1974, but there have been important new developments. I want to make you, the American public, aware of some very significant events which have occurred over the past several months, matters about which you have been kept in the dark by the major news media controlled by the dynasty. I especially want to point out to you that there is still hope if the American people wake up in time. Some of the events lately have not been according to the dynasty's plans. As I say these words, the dynasty is scuffling to keep its balance. They are now using all the powers at their command to keep the lid on a huge scandal, a scandal bigger than the Tibot Dome in which the dynasty was involved, a scandal bigger than Watergate which the dynasty brought about, a scandal so big it could stop the dynasty in their tracks if the American people find out what they have done. I refer to the Fort Knox Gold Scandal, the theft of America's gold supply, and the destruction of our dollar by the dynasty through their agents within our government. Part 2 My friends, in late December 1974, the Great Gold Robbery was nominated by William Sapphire of the New York Times as one of the four candidates for the biggest news story of 1975. And no wonder. For one thing, making off with America's gold supply will doubtless go down in the annals of crime as the biggest theft in all of history, around 50 billion dollars at the current market price of gold. For another thing, the alleged burglars are none other than the kingpins of America's most powerful family, people whose names would top any social register, and who are associated in the public mind with good manners and philanthropic activities. But most of all, this astronomical case of embezzlement will, unless it is corrected soon, leave America utterly defenseless against the chill wind of monetary instability that is sweeping the entire world. And herein lies the danger for the dynasty. They have made mistakes. They have left a trail. Their guilt can be proven. If their strenuous efforts to suppress the truth do not succeed, the American public will be able to see them for what they are, suave, manicured traitors who have wounded our beloved country more grievously than Benedict Arnold ever thought of doing. Here now is what has been happening. You will probably recall the visit which Congressmen and newsmen made to Fort Knox on September 23, 1974, to look at America's gold stored there. This so-called gold inspection visit, which was unprecedented, was arranged by our government purely as a publicity gimmick to try to defuse my charges that the gold had been illegally removed by private interests. Only one of the 28 compartments was opened to display gold to the visitors, and that compartment was selected ahead of time by government officials. The compartment that the visitors entered into was indeed stacked from floor to ceiling with some 36,000 metal bars but they had a noticeably reddish hue instead of the gold and yellow for which gold is renowned. The reason for this odd color, my friends, 
is that what the visitors saw was not pure gold, that is .995 fine or better, as required for use in international monetary settlements. It was instead melted down coin gold containing 10% copper, something known in monetary circles as junk gold. Of course, such highly impure gold does have some value in a market sense, but not as backing for currency, since no nation on earth would accept it for that purpose. Thus for monetary purposes, and that was what the Fort Knox visit was all about, the visitors saw nothing that could be counted as part of America's alleged monetary gold hoard. A number of the visitors noticed a very apparent reddish tint to the bars, but not being gold experts, no one thought to ask about it during the news conference held afterward by Mrs. Barry Brooks, the Director of the United States Mint. Thus the visitors' day at Fort Knox ended in a light-hearted carnival atmosphere just as it had begun when the visitors chose popsicle sticks to determine their order in viewing the open compartment. Mrs. Brooks happily said, See, it's all here, and then sent the Congressmen and newsmen off on their happy way like a bunch of Cub Scouts leaving a den meeting. As for you and I at home, the dynasty's controlled major news media served up a nice pablum to swallow, a few words to the effect that Fort Knox had been visited, a few pretty but not too revealing pictures, and the comforting pronouncement of Mary Brooks that it's all here. For further reassurance, we were also informed that the gold inspection visit would be followed up by an independent audit of the Fort Knox Gold by the General Accounting Office and Arm of Congress. The Fort Knox Gold Inspection hoax largely succeeded in hoodwinking most Americans into believing all was well at Fort Knox, but not so Europe and Canada. When the foreign reporters among the delegation to Fort Knox filed their report, their observation of the reddish appearance of the gold led very quickly to a correct evaluation of the hoax that had been perpetrated among the American people. Financial eyebrows the world over were raised in amazement. The United States Government, putting its best foot forward, had failed to display any good delivery gold. The only logical conclusion was that there was none available to show exactly as I had charged. So transparent and blatant was the Fort Knox Gold Inspection hoax that for a time last fall it was a favorite topic of political cartoons and jokes in Europe. Those words of Mary Brooks, it's all here, have been used widely by humorists in the foreign press which largely lies beyond the reach of the dynasty. As a catchphrase for the worldwide laughing stock the United States Treasury has become, it's a sad commentary that here in America the dynasty's stranglehold on our mass media is so complete that a phrase which is ridiculed everywhere else, it's all here is seriously accepted as gospel truth by many Americans, but we think it couldn't happen here. Within a month, on October 21, 1974, the General Accounting Office quickly submitted a report on its audit to the Treasury Department. There was not a word of official comment, however, until December 3. 1974. On that date, during Congressional testimony, Treasury Secretary William Simon casually dropped what should have been a bombshell 
by agreeing that the gold in Fort Knox is inferior to other United States gold. That is an admission that there is no good delivery gold in Fort Knox, and as such flatly contradicts an official Treasury document dated August 31, 1974, which shows 24 million ounces of good delivery gold in Fort Knox. And to make matters worse, even the document of August 31 conflicts with previous official documents showing 147 million ounces of monetary gold in Fort Knox, more than six times as much. But our major media, doing the dynasty's bidding, virtually ignored Secretary Simon's astonishing testimony concerning the poor quality of the gold in Fort Knox. What the media did choose to report giving the public exactly the opposite impression about what was going on was Secretary Simon's announcement during the same testimony that on January 6, 1975, the Treasury would auction off 2 million ounces of gold. Then on December 9, 1974, quietly and unnoticed by the general public, the Treasury unlawfully bought 2 million ounces of gold from the Tiny Exchange Stabilization Fund so as to have something to sell on January 6, 1975, in their effort to discredit my charges that America is gold poor. By interesting coincidence, the Treasury's purchase completely emptied the Exchange Stabilization Fund. On December 11, 1974, Mr. Thomas Wolf, Director of the Office of Domestic Gold and Silver Operations of the United States Treasury, confirmed that the General Accounting Office audit of the Fort Knox Gold had been completed as of some undefined earlier date, and yet the news conference to release the audit, which the Director of the United States Mint had earlier promised for December 23, 1974, failed to materialize. Instead, as that date approached, the release date for the audit was suddenly delayed to January 31, 1975, without explanation. Meanwhile, I was informed through my confidential sources that the Treasury and the General Accounting Office were trying to collaborate on what to say in an audit report that would not be too dangerous to release to the American people. The audit itself, according to my sources, reveals that there is nothing left in Fort Knox except some 90,000 bars of junk gold unfit for international monetary settlements. If this is what the audit shows, it is in complete agreement with my charges. On January 6, 1975, the celebrated auction so-called of United States gold was carried out. The auction had only one purpose, to fool the American people into thinking we still had gold while in reality squeezing out one last little bit of bullion from our country. But mounting public enthusiasm over gold, combined with lingering suspicions about Fort Knox, had created a potentially dangerous situation for the dynasty, which they had to nip in the bud. They dared not allow demand on January 6 to exceed the 2 million ounces which were put up for sale, since the Treasury then would have been expected to arrange promptly for a second auction, something they could hardly do since there are few ounces of good delivery gold left in America. America is gold poor. The solution to the dynasty's problem 
was to precede the gold sale with a four-week blitz of anti-gold propaganda through their major news media outlets. Suddenly the country was overrun with writers and newsmen who had become instant authorities on gold. Americans were flooded with warnings about the great gold sale fiasco which would be expected on January 6. Even the United States Treasury itself warned potential United States gold dealers to stay away. Thus warned, America has gradually cooled off about gold and finally stayed away in droves on January 6. Only 750,000 ounces were sold in Washington, and guess who bought it? You're right. 500,000 ounces went to dynasty interests, while 250,000 ounces went to a foreign group that cooperates with the dynasty. Before the auction, most of the rest of the gold had been dumped on the London market, depressing gold prices there. After the sale, Treasury Secretary Simon congratulated the bamboozled American people for their wisdom in staying out of the gold auction. Only two days later those foolish few who did buy gold at the auction, namely the dynasty and their collaborators, were rewarded by seeing the value of their bullion jump by more than $10 an ounce, the biggest gain in history for a single day of gold trading. Thus the gold auction of January 6 served the interests of the dynasty perfectly, and as usual at the expense of the trusting American public. But the problem of the Fort Knox Gold Audit still remained. The new release date of January 31 came and went. The audit was not released, and once again no explanation was given. As I say these words, most Americans still don't realize what is going on. The dynasties controlled major news media have blacklisted and boycotted the story of the Fort Knox Gold scandal, and it will require great courage for any news media, even the handful not yet directly controlled by the dynasty, to break the story. But the Fort Knox scandal cover-up is beginning to come unstuck. The story has now been broken in Europe by Mr. Gordon Tether, perhaps the world's most influential financial writer, in the Financial Times of London for February 11, 1975. Mr. Tether's words speak for themselves. Quote, Close observers of the Fort Knox mystery assure me that this, so far unexplained, official procrastination, read in conjunction with other circumstantial evidence, strongly suggests that it is no longer a question of whether there is a discrepancy between the figures and the physical reality, but what the size of the gap is. It is hardly necessary to point out that, if it does become apparent that the Treasury has itself been the seat of a scandal of Watergate-type proportions, the consequences for America in general and her dollar in particular could be very serious. The puzzling thing is why the Administration is not hastening to demonstrate that there is no cause for concern if it is in a position to do so." Unquote. Within hours the Tether article flushed out an odd two-page document consisting of a report on the audit, which was quietly delivered to interested parties in Congress. Its purpose was apparently to blunt the effect of the devastating article by Mr. Tether but as such conveys a note of desperation. It is cleverly written to give the appearance of substance, but careful reading reveals that nowhere 
does it give the results of the audit. A few days later, responding to steadily mounting pressure, Director of the Met, Mrs. Mary Brooks, admitted in writing for the first time that America's gold supply consists mostly of melted coin gold, that is, junk gold. As of March 1, 1975, the date of this message, the General Accounting Office audit of the Fort Knox gold still has not been released, even though it was completed over four months ago on October 21, 1974. No explanation for the delay has been given, but my confidential sources inform me that high-level pressure from the dynasty to massage the audit is taking quite a toll. As of this moment, I am informed that one of the General Accounting Office's auditors has resigned in protest and that two others have refused to sign the audit. Furthermore, the resignation of at least one of the high officials ensnared in this sad drama has now been tendered, though it has not yet been accepted. As events are now progressing, the Fort Knox gold theft will in all probability be a major national scandal this year, 1975. It will implicate not only public officials but influential people in the private sector as well. The infamous Teapot Dome scandal of the early 1920s was used by the dynasty to crush their rival in crude oil, Harry F. Sinclair. More recently the dynasty engineered a major scandal called Watergate to crush President Nixon for their own political advancement in power. The Fort Knox Gold Scandal, in which the dynasty is now involved, will also crush its victims, but this time there is a difference. This time the scandal did not erupt at their instigation. The gold theft was supposed to proceed quietly, do its immense damage, and never be detected. But they have made mistakes, important mistakes, because they can be traced, and this time it is the dynasty itself that may well be crushed by their own greedy misdeeds. If they can, if we allow them to, the dynasty will yet find a way to sidestep the crushing response to their actions and let those who have merely followed their orders be smashed in their place. We therefore dare not be complacent. If we permit them to escape the justice they so richly deserve, it is we, the American people, whom the dynasty will crush next by means of the political and economic chaos they are deliberately bringing upon us all. Part 3 Our Planned Economic Collapse my friends, I have dealt at some length with the Fort Knox Gold Scandal for a very good reason. For one thing, it illustrates how the American people are being swindled daily by the dynasty's major news media, but that is not why I have discussed it so fully. It is also a crime, a theft so immense, so mind-boggling, that any other great robbery you can name shrinks into invisibility by comparison, but even that is not the measure of its importance. The true significance of the Fort Knox Gold Scandal is its pivotal role as part of the dynasty's grand design to complete their takeover of the United States of America by bringing about an economic catastrophe and turning the resulting political upheaval to their own ends. If you are a typical American citizen, you probably couldn't care less about gold bullion hidden away in government vaults, monetary affairs, and the like. To you, quite logically, money is just a medium of exchange. The gold in Fort Knox is supposed to back up our money, and that's about all there is to it. 
Such a monetary concept is natural, logical, and healthy, but unfortunately that is not the way it works. The manipulation of money and its relationship to gold is a source of incredible economic and therefore political power. Centuries ago a powerful international banker summed it all up in a famous dictum to the effect, Give me the right to issue a nation's currency, and I care not who writes the laws. The context of his statement was not that he would thus be content with his wealth, but rather that the writers of the laws would find it necessary to do his bidding. So well did our Founding Fathers recognize the dangers from this source that they wrote strong provisions into our Constitution to prevent such abuses. But the dynasty that began developing a century ago in America was quick to recognize the vast power they could wield if they could cause these and related constitutional safeguards to be ignored. In my message of October 1974 I reviewed for you the emergence of the dynasty and their achievement of several major objectives that made 1913 a major turning point in our history. One of these was their successful creation in 1913 of the very thing Jefferson had warned against, their unconstitutional private central banking system known as the Federal Reserve System. In the wake of the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that followed, Congressman Lewis McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, waged a courageous campaign against the Federal Reserve that ended abruptly with his death by poisoning. Referring to the Depression, he declared, It was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. And he added that those who had brought it about, using the Federal Reserve and other means, sought to bring about a condition of despair here so that they might emerge as the rulers of us all. Few people are aware of it today, but there was a great deal of evidence to back up Congressman McFadden's charges that the crash and depression were deliberate. But as it turned out, the Great Depression, as bad as it was, was not quite severe enough to induce Americans to throw away our system of government, even though our Republic was reduced to a very precarious condition. The American people had proven to be tougher than the dynasty expected. Their first attempt to take our country away from us had failed, and so the dynasty began a long-range plan for a second attempt at a complete takeover of America, and this time they would leave nothing to chance. First. Capitalizing on the economic woes they had created, they set in motion a wide range of social legislation to vastly increase the power of the Federal Government, which they dominated increasingly. They began the planning of World War II for two purposes. One was to increase the dynasty's power worldwide at the expense of certain troublesome oil rivals overseas. The other was to further vastly expand the domestic power of the Federal Government dominated by the dynasty through a wide range of wartime emergency measures which would not be undone after the war. Withholding of income taxes from your paycheck is but one example of this. Their plans for World War II worked out very well for the dynasty, 
the Federal Government emerged from the war greatly enlarged and with far broader domestic powers and with a dynasty firmly in charge. Overseas, the dynasty's crude oil competition from Great Britain had been broken and the sun began to set on the British Empire. America was number one, and the dynasty was number one in America. Their plan continued. They would now gradually sap America's economic strength through massive foreign aid programs and no-win wars siphoning off America's wealth into the dynasty's coffers overseas. By the same means they would gradually bring about internal dissension and loss of confidence among the American people. They would in every way cause our government to increasingly ignore our constitutional safeguards and then blame are resulting problems on the Constitution itself. They would prepare a new Constitution to suit their own purposes and have it ready. They would condition us for several years ahead of time to accept various things that would seem to be described in the new Constitution. They would quietly promote for years the idea that our Constitution had become obsolete. Then at last, when all was in readiness, they would once again put us through the ringer of economic depression to trigger the political changes they sought. This time we would be a society that was already losing its way before the Depression, and this time they would not be as gentle about it as they had been with their Depression of the 1930s. The new Depression would come with all the trimmings, runaway inflation, unemployment rising far beyond anything experienced in the 1930s, shortages, and general chaos. And that, my friends, is where we are now. Their plan is now in its final stages. Their manipulated depression has now begun. We are now being fed into the dynasty's economic wringer to be squeezed unmercifully. They have deliberately wrought worldwide monetary instability through a series of acts described in my message of October 1974 and, as described in that message, the theft of America's gold by the dynasty is tied directly to the manipulations which are destroying our dollar and fueling our inflation. Thus the Fort Knox Gold Scandal is not only about a stupendous crime, it is an economic Pearl Harbor by which the dynasty has declared war on the American people. Their objective in this war is our unconditional surrender by our acceptance of their dictatorial new Constitution. Part 4 The Emerging Dictatorship My friends, since my message of October 1974, the dynasty's overall plan has not changed at all, but there have been some adjustments in their tactics and their timing, and others can be expected from time to time. The key revision of their timing came on December 16, 1974, on the island of Martinique where there was a meeting between Presidents Ford and Giscard d'Estaing of France. The head of the dynasty, whose presence at the meeting was not generally publicized, agreed to allow France to revalue its gold holdings 
at the current market price every six months, but on one condition. No government shall officially repay the gold price for an interim period of two years, that is, till the end of 1976. In other words, the dynasty is now allowing itself that long, instead of a year and a half, to push gold prices above $2,000 per ounce and then peg it officially at an International Monetary Conference at $2,000 per ounce. Thus, as predicted in my October 1974 message, Europe is now moving rapidly back onto a gold standard. In January, France revalued its gold holdings at $170 an ounce and will apparently support gold at that price. This means that there is now a floor of $170 under gold prices. French currency is again on what amounts to a modified gold standard, and the American dollar has been devalued indirectly. Official devaluation of the dollar for the third time can be expected soon. As predicted in my message October 1974, scattered failures of major banks have occurred, chipping away at public confidence. There will be more such occurrences. The gold zoom signal given in my October 1974 message was fulfilled in November 1974. Gold prices promptly started up rapidly, but the dynasty aborted that takeoff as I have discussed in connection with the January 6 gold sale. The dynasty has been trying both to complete their silver corner and to extract the gold from the International Monetary Fund, and have encountered more resistance than expected in both areas. They have also been trying desperately to divert attention away from the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. They cannot wait indefinitely, however, because their political objectives require gold prices and American inflation to be sky-high by Election Day 1976. At this moment, March 1, 1975, Gold is once again over $180 an ounce, and if it stays that way for several weeks, it will signal a release of the bricks by the dynasty. After that, gold will streak for the sky, and the dollar will dive for the basement. The worldwide starvation publicized by the Rome Conference in 1974 is a prelude to starvation in America. The dynasty can pull the plug at any time now, so be prepared. Supermarkets everywhere can be turned into wastelands within a matter of days. However, the major crunch nationwide is now planned for the fall of 1975. Nelson Rockefeller was confirmed as Vice President in December 1974 and plans to be President by June 1975. Presumably Gerald Ford will resign with a plausible explanation, such as his failure to turn the economy around. The autumn of 1975 will be a turbulent period. Major food shortages unprecedented inflation, epidemic bankruptcies, soaring interest rates, and mushrooming unemployment. President Rockefeller moving decisively and with great perception will galvanize the nation by proposing that a new Constitution be written to solve our problems. Quickly, a commission will be formed by President Rockefeller 
to start drafting a new Constitution. Your suggestions and contributions will be solicited, and it will be the task of the Constitutional Commission to sort it all out into the best document possible. Soon progress on the new Constitution will be a frequent item in the news as respected scholars and famous public officials offer their views and suggestions. Sometime during the fall of 1975 look for the following crash signal, which is the counterpart of the gold zoom signal I told you about in my message October 1974. Right now the stock market is being held up artificially by the dynasty to save its demise for the proper moment. But when government figures are made public that show general unemployment in a range of 20 to 25 percent, the stock market crash will be imminent. These figures will indicate that the dynasty is ready to cut the cable on the stock market elevator and let it start its sickening plunge into the basement. 1976 will be a year of unmitigated economic disaster in the United States, with developments on the new Constitution as the only dependable bright spot in the news served up by the dynasty's media. President Rockefeller will, of course, be seen doing all in his power to contribute to this critical effort to save our democracy. In my message of October I mentioned that red back currency would be coming on the scene about now, and these have now been printed and more are being printed in one, five, ten, and twenty dollar denominations, as well as in paper change denominations of one, five, ten, and twenty five cents. It has been decided, however, not to issue them yet, but instead to wait for the peak of the inflation. They will then be introduced with a psychologically crushing reverse split whereby you will exchange perhaps 100 green dollars for one red dollar. Because of this reverse split scheme, my suggestion contained in my message of October 1974 that you save the copper-clad coins now in circulation loses some of its value. Prior to the green for red exchange, they will be good to have and quite possibly growing scarcer. But after the red backs appear, coins probably will no longer be officially acceptable as a medium of exchange. The exact timing of the introduction of the red backs will depend on the dynasty's judgment of the maximum advantage it will provide them. It may well be the last straw dropped on the backs of the American people in the 1976 election campaign. One of the saddest things I have had to reveal has to do with the 1976 Presidential Election Campaign. Nelson Rockefeller has already selected the man who will be the Democratic nominee to run against him and it will not be any of those who are now campaigning, nor will it be any candidate in the Democratic primaries. The nominee will be a dark horse, a man who recently retired from a very visible and successful political career to devote his efforts to religious activities such as prayer meetings for prominent politicians. At the 1976 Democratic Convention his name will suddenly emerge as the man needed to provide America with the moral leadership it so desperately needs. Organized labor, which will have strangely refused to back any candidate 
up till then will throw its full support behind him, and he will become the nominee. It will be a thrilling turn of events, and the Democratic Convention will go wild. But the stage will have been set for a truly tragic contest between moral leadership on the part of the Democratic nominee and the mess of pottage held out to a starving America by President Nelson Rockefeller. The President will have made the new Constitution the only issue in his campaign, and the people at large will be voting in a referendum during that election to either accept or reject the Constitution. The new Constitution will have been completed only weeks before the election itself, thanks to unceasing encouragement and prodding of the Constitutional Commission by President Rockefeller. Very few Americans will have had the opportunity to read or study it, and will not realize that it merely duplicates a model Constitution published quietly in 1974 after a multi-million dollar ten-year project funded by the dynasty. But no matter, we will have been hearing all about its progress for a year, and analysis by top news commentators will have assured us of its great merit. Our hearts and our souls may yearn to vote for the Democratic challenger and his moral leadership. But our empty stomachs and our crying, hungry children will convince us that we have no choice. All over America citizens will walk into voting booths and review the names before us on fixable voting machines put there by the dynasty. Many will linger and wonder, but in the end voting levers will decisively decree Nelson Rockefeller to be elected and the new Constitution to be accepted, under which President Rockefeller will begin a nine-year term. Someday in 1977 we will all gradually begin to wake up as we see the high-sounding phrases of the new Constitution coming to light, as a horrible Frankenstein monster smashing and destroying our treasured freedoms right and left. As a formerly free people, we will gradually become enraged at what has been done to us, and the dynasty knows it. Therefore, within a year or so after the new Constitution comes into force, that is, by late 1977 or thereabouts, the dynasty's final act of subjugation will begin, World War III. In a sense, it will only be half a world war, since it will not involve Canada or Europe, but it will be a nuclear holocaust with the United States as the prime battleground killing over half of our people. An official understanding has already been reached whereby Washington, D.C., alone among major cities in the United States, will be left unscathed by the war. In return, the capitals of Russia, China, and Japan, the new axes of the 70s, will also be spared. America will make no effective retaliation, and the war will drag on for 13 months with pauses for negotiation. Coming events cast their shadow, and on February 12, 1975, Secretary of the Interior Rogers Morton said in a Dallas speech that if America were attacked right now, we could not defend ourselves, but still we say it couldn't happen here. After the war our greatest cities will be gone, but the crude oil and other mineral resources which have always preoccupied the dynasty will still be there. 
accessible and waiting. And now the dynasty will have 100 million or so broken-hearted but hungry slaves to exploit these resources. A dream come true for them, but an unending nightmare for the rest of us. Yes, this is their plan. It is insane. It is inhuman. It is unthinkable to most of us. So was Mein Kampf of Adolf Hitler. But it is their plan, and it is up to us, the American people, to stop it. Talk to your neighbors, your friends, your relatives about these things. That is how public opinion spreads, and only public popular awareness can do the job. To be aware is to be powerful, as the dynasty well knows. That is why they do all in their power to keep you unaware of the truth. If it is God's will and we all do our part, we can break free of the shackles of the dynasty. If we succeed as a people in doing so, our beloved United States of America can bloom as never before with enthusiasm, initiative, and human dignity. If we do not succeed, it is only those of us who have tried our best who will have peace in our hearts and answers for our enslaved children. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you.